Hi, and welcome to our CodeTube webinar on how to build, test, and deploy Docker images when running microservices in production. I'm Manuel Weiss, the co-founder and director of marketing at CodeTube, and with me today is Daniel Van Gils, developer advocate at Cloud66. Today's webinar is really interesting. Um, Daniel will talk about the advantages of creating a microservices architecture using Docker containers. And he'll also talk about how you should approach building your Docker images and will provide some best practices for it. Um, and finally, Daniel will talk about the importance of having test frameworks and consistent workflows for your development process, which is one of the most important things for modern software development teams. Um, I also want to mention that throughout Daniel's talk, we will collections and I will answer them via the questions panel, um, via text. But we will also have a dedicated Q&A session after Daniel's presentation. So feel free to answer questions, and if we don't answer them, we most probably will pick them up in the Q&A session to go more in detail with our answers. And I also want to say that we are recording this webinar, and I will send the video recording and some additional information like the presentation slides and other useful resources um, next week to you via email. But enough from me, um, let's get started, and I'm handing over to you, Daniel. Thank you, Manny. Um, Daniel here, developer advocate at Cloud66. So today we're going um, talking about running microservices in production with Docker, CodeChip, and Cloud66. So let's uh, let's start with the first slide here. So just start about what microservice architecture is, and this is basically the setup where I want to start this presentation with. So if you look at microservice architectures, services are easy to replace, and also services are oriented around um, capabilities. And the nice thing was I really liked using Microsoft architecture that you can use different programming languages, databases, and software environments. And this is really interesting. If you if you look at it, um, when you are starting thinking about Microsoft ar architecture and all that stuff, and you look at GitHub and all these great libraries you find on GitHub, and you want to inter integrating your architecture, there's one big problem. So how can I run the different program languages on my machines? And a couple of years ago when Docker came around, this was quite interesting for me because I'm like, okay, so this you know, whole containerization and using Docker, that makes sense. And especially in the Microsoft architecture where you want to have like a polyglotic approach to uh, software development, uh, Docker can, 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 can be very handy. But um, if you are new to Docker or you want to learn Docker, you probably feel a little bit like this. Uh, this is an artwork in the harbor of Holland. I'm, I'm from, from Holland, by the way. And uh, you feel like, okay, so how does this you know, container fit in my IT uh, landscape? How do I create this image? What is an image? What is a container? What is a service? So you have all these things you need to learn. And um, so basically, there's some kind of learning curve here. So if you have the time and skills, it's a little bit of the learning curve if you start with containers. So basically, you start with the Hello World. You know, if you you pick up some Docker 101 uh, tutorial, you find this uh, this line like Docker Run Alpine Echo Hello World, and you're like, okay, this is great. So I'm running this inside the container. But in the end, of course, you want to you know run your Microsoft architecture in production, and uh, so you start learning, and probably you got you compose some services, and you you, you get familiar with Docker Compose. But still, there's a gap. I mean, there's a gap between you know running it on your local machine and running like real workload in production. So today, with this webinar, I try to help you navigate that noise, make make a little bit of a, a shortcut. So it makes you more easy to go from Docker Run, Echo Hello World, Docker Compose to production. So basically, today uh, we're going to talk about two things. First how to create the right container image, and second, how do you run, run containers in production? I'm going to use like a simple microservice example and also showing how, to you, how you can test your microservices. So let's take a little bit step back. So back in the days when you had to, you know, provision bare metal and you, uh, and you want to run an application, between development and really operating something in production, that takes a, uh, a lot of time. So between development and operations, that's a lot of time. Now with cloud and VMs, between 
development and operations and also the more polyglotic approach where you run like maybe Java and Python on different VMs make it more, much more easy to deploy. And now with containers, what you're seeing is that between development and operations, so the whole de DevOps movement is getting really, really close. So basically, the developers already, you know, doing some operational stuff for you. I mean, they create the image. So for people who are not really familiar yet with Docker, um, so when I'm talking about service, I mean your code, the code which provides your service. So when, if you want to run your service, you have to build it. You build basically the image. And your image is built by this Docker file. And then this image is shipped to a Docker engine, which runs your containers, and eventually is deployed on a cluster of servers, which is your platform. But now we're going to look at how to do with images. So basically, if you look at um, a development workflow, uh, this is one you can can use. For instance, um, so you have your development machine, your laptop. You're running Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows, or or if you're uh, if you have running Linux, you're just running on Linux. You have your code, and you build your service in an image. Then you run your tests, and if your test fails, you, you of course you you develop your code, make sure your tests pass, and then you signal your continuous integration system like CodeShip and saying, okay, let's you know build my build my images from this source code and run the tests and also the integration. So if that fails, you have to still, you know, go back and, and edit your code and run the tests and, you know, push your code again and then you can continue the integration system will run again. And when that's green, you can say to your Docker platform, just, you know, deploy this new image. So you create a continuous deployment. There. And, and, for, and, if, and that's really important because if you're running Microsoft architecture, you're probably looking at not one service, but maybe a, a couple dozens of services. So you also need something in your pipeline where you can just test one service and deploy it individually on your um, production environments. So for today, we're going to use this microservice example. Uh, I created a really small example, just, I mean, I would. I also have an example with, with eight of nine services, but that makes a little bit vague how, where everything sits. So basically, what we're going to do, we have a front end. So we're not going to talk about the front end today, but there's a front end, and with the front end, which is an HTML front end, we can request some work. So we basically t tell the API, "I've got work." The API knows how to post that work in a message queue. And on the other side, we have a worker waiting for, for work and you find, okay, so I have some work, do the work, and then single back to the API and saying, okay, the work is done. Normally, the worker will, you know, single back to the message queue, but I just want to have this simple architecture where also services talk to each other, not only uh, through a message queue. So basically, in my example, uh, with the front end, I just can say, I want five donuts. So I request five donuts, and then my API knows how to receive the orders and give the orders to the baking minions in the message queue. And then the worker knows I can bake one donut in a couple of seconds. And when that donut is, is done, I single back the API, and in the front end, I get the signal, okay, this is done. So I put the code on GitHub. So if you are want to run this thing uh, on your own computer, want to run this on CodeShip and all that stuff, just check it out here. In the end, I also put in the link, so you don't have to write it uh, now down and check it out. We'll, we'll, um, in the end, I will put it on the holding slide. So basically, uh, so I'm not going to demo it live because with uh, with this um, webinar, sometimes the, the frames drop, so I'm, I made a couple of screenshots. So basically, this thing is running in production. You see that I'm, I'm placing an order of donuts, strawberry flavor, and hundreds. I want to. I want 100 ones. And over here, you see that order is placed. And now in the background, my workers are going to bake that donut. And you see in the end, hundreds of donuts are baked and are done. And here you can see that my API service is running and showing the orders. So I'm running Docker in production on Cloud 66. What you're seeing right now is our interface. You see that we're running a Docker cluster. And there's like 42. So uh, containers running. So I have six APIs containers running, six front end, um, and 30 workers. So basically, if you look at, at Microsoft's architecture, 
you get a bit of this picture. So you have the different services. They need other services where they have to. I mean, maybe they need a database, maybe a message queue, or a service has to service A has to uh, to communicate to service B. So you end up with this spider web of all services in your environment. So how do you, I mean, how do you develop this? How do you test this kind of architecture? So if you check out my code, what you can see is that I created three services, API, front-end, and worker. And I created a Docker Compose file. With Docker Compose, you can re easily compose services on your local machine, saying I want to start a front-end Oh, wait, sorry. Uh, a front end, an API, and a worker. And also, I can specify what kind of back end service they need for MySQL database, RevDMQ, which is the message queue I'm using, or maybe also the worker wants to talk back to the API. So I make a link that also a worker can find the API. So this is basically the whole integration of all your microservices. And Docker Compose is really great for that. So if you check out the code, then you can do something like docker compose up minus d source daemon, and then it will start up the front end, MySQL server, API, and worker. And if you do like docker compose ps, you can see that all the servers are running. And if you hit localhost on that port, you will see that the thing is running on your local machine. And I can and you see and this is this is the log file. So this is a log file of my worker. So this is a worker who outputs uh, what kind of work it's doing. So basically, if I submit something, and uh, oh wait, um, when I submit something, so normally when you have like one worker and your worker takes like one second, then it takes 10 seconds, of course, to finish the job. But the nice thing about Docker and containers, you really can spin up more containers if you need more capacity. So you can do this with Docker Compose scale worker is 10. This meaning that we're spinning up 10 workers right away and when I submit, like, I want to have donuts, flavor run, and 200, and I submit that, then you see in this view that uh, a lot of workers are starting to bake those donuts. So that makes, you know, processing much faster. So the, the nice thing about running Docker uh, uh, with microservices is that you really can easily scale up uh, the, uh, your capacity. So back in this picture, so we have this spider web of all the services. So how are we going to test this? So basically, this is one way to do it. There are probably more ways to test Microsoft architecture. From my experience, this is a great way to do it. So what you, the first thing you want to do is isolate your tests. So make sure that your code and your microservice is isolated and you only bring the service that it needs to fulfill the tests. So let's take a look at how we isolated tests for the API. So if you look at the code, we have the API here, and in the API, I created a Docker Compose file. And in the Docker Compose file, I also have a test. And that test is also spinning up the API and all the dependencies it needs, and then run the tests. So for instance, if I do something like Docker Compose run test, you can see right here that the MySQL server is started, RabbitMQ is started, the API is started. And because with Docker Compose, you don't know when your services are up and running, you need something like a health check. So with the last release of Docker 1.12, they also incorporate health checks. But before that, you need something like a health check. Because if you don't do a health check and you run your tests and your API is not ready or your MySQL server is not uh, spinned up, your test will fail. So it's really important that you um, do some health check on your services. So when this is run, it will health check and then run the tests. I only have like two examples. So this is this is uh, the tester screen, and uh, and I say Docker Compose stop. So I stop. I close down the whole uh, compose of all the services. The nice thing is that I only spin up my MySQL server, RabbitMQ, and API just for the test, and I'm done. I just delete it. So every time I run this test, I start with, this, uh, with a clean slate. And that's really what I like about testing with Docker, uh, that you can spin up your, what you need and then it's clean. If you look at uh, isolated tests for worker, it's basically the same thing. So, uh, so we have the worker and we have this um, start script with, uh, with RSpec and it runs uh, a couple of uh, tests for us. 
So again, I can go to my uh, service uh, folder to worker and then say Docker Compose run test and it will my tests again. You can see right here that it's starting up my worker, waits for something in the RabbitMQ. So I, I send in a message and wait if it start baking the bagel and if it's okay, then my tests are passed. And I do a dog post stop and it will stop all the containers I don't need anymore. And in the end, you of course want to integrate all the tests and of course you want a development environment. Um, so this is where, where the Docker Compose file comes in again. So we have the Docker Compose file here, which describes our service front-end API worker and all our backend services. And um, if you're going to use, for instance, CodeShip, what you can do, you can create a CodeShip service with YAML, which describes also my API test, API, the worker, and my infrastructure. And also, you create the steps, so I can say, well, if I want a full test of my, uh, my Microsoft architecture, when I push on master, you can see it right here, tech master, just run the test for the API and run the test for the worker. And the nice thing you can um, also, um, this is also what I also advocate, is that you try to mimic your production environment on your local machine, but also when you, uh, because you don't want to have like different environments. So with Jet, Jet, Jet is, um, is a command line test tool made by Coaching where you can just say Jet steps, tag master, and then it starts the services and run the tests. So what you're seeing right now on the screen is that you see both tests run and then it says, okay, this is finished. And then I can, you know, tell my production environment, you can, you know, uh, deploy my new uh, images. So this is how it looks like on CodeShip. So you see that I, <laughs> I'm fixing the typo here in my in my uh, webinar CodeShip. You see that it's building the services like normal images and then run the steps. I test API, test worker, and finds out when your test uh, gives the exit code one, then it fails. If it's exit code zero, then it's it's um, it's okay, and so you can, and the nice thing about testing like this way that I'm really testing from the outside in. You can, of course, have different approaches of testing, but uh, in this webinar, I wanted to show you that you can also just spin up your real production code and then test externally to that code so that you really have testing from the outside in. And of course, you can create an extra test where you test tests, do the unit tests, and then do the outside-in test of your containers. So basically, if you are going to run microservices in production using Docker, there's one thing you need to know is something about the containerization machine. Containerization is basically taking your code, create a Docker file, and create images. But the thing is, when you put like shit in inside your containerization machine, you still, you know, create images. I mean, you have this, you know, shit with a nice, you know, which is nicely dressed, but in the end, in production, it is, you know, doomed. So make sure that you don't put shit on top of it because it's not a silver bullet. You can't polish a turd in that way. So you really need to stop thinking, how can we uh, optimize our containerization machine? So, a couple of things I want to share with you. So, the right image should be the same in all your environments. So, make sure that the image you are using on your local machine is the same in your testing environment, in your staging environment, if you're using a staging environment, and if you are, you know, just going from testing to production, it has to be the same in production. So, make sure of that. Also, the right test should be the same in all your environments. So, if my tests are running on my local machine, and also in my continuous integration system, it has to be the same. So make sure that's all aligned. Often you get this get this saying, I didn't have time to create a slim image, so I created a fat one instead. So at Cloud 66, we deployed the last one and a half year, we're running Docker in production for all, all, over a thousand customers. Um, and I did some research, and what we're seeing is that a lot of people trying to create a fat image with everything inside it. So 
to create the right image, you need at least five kisses. It's not that you're going to kiss your, your image or something, but it's it's more like this little that you can, um, don't forget what kisses. It's keep an image slim, secure, speedy, stable, and set. So let me uh, dive into that. So slim. So start with the minimal image you can find and trust. Sometimes you just say, okay, my base image is Ubuntu, but you have no idea what, what's all inside that image. There's a lot of things you don't need. So remove all the compiled type dependencies. I mean, you don't need all these extra tools you, you find in a full Ubuntu distribution. You only need the stuff, the minimal stuff to run your microservice. If your microservice is just like, like one megabyte, why are you going to create uh, an image which is 300 megabytes? I mean, with Docker, of course you have the layered file system, and of course, if you running already push the, the, the images to, the, to your uh, platform and you, you change the code, only the change layer is pushed. But if you are going to do like auto scaling, provisioning new servers, it takes a lot of time because each new server has to pull all those layers. So it's really important that you remove packages you don't need, squash the, layers, squash the layers to reduce size, and of course run stats for your image. You can also run the stats. Uh, in your continuous integration system, you can just say, okay, is this is the size increased, decreased? How does uh, my my um, layers look like? So there's this uh, Docker build flow tool called Habitus. You can also use that to make your images smaller. And also on the blogs of CodeShip and on Cloud 66 blogs, you find all uh, nice articles about creating this slim image. Secure. So also remove all the secrets. The thing is that you're, you're using a layered file system. So for instance, if you are going to pull some sequence in, it's still there. If you remove it, uh, a couple of lines in your Docker file, that layer is still there because it's a layered file system. So make sure that if you are using secrets, make sure that you squash your layers. Patch to the latest security updates. Make sure that everything is secure in your image. And also run the image with the right user ID. So don't run everything in root. So with the latest version, like 1.11 Docker Engine, um, there is like uh, a user uh, name spacing, but before that it wasn't. But still, it's good practice not to run your processes as root. And of course, test your images, but that's uh, that's where we where, where we're here. And also, quite interesting is Docker released this Docker Bench security tool where you can run against your images and running containers, where you can find out if you compile with all if if your image and your running containers are uh, secure. Speedy. So, I mean, optimize code, that makes sense. So, optimize your code, uh, but also make sure that you monitor your memory and CPU uses, usage. This is really important when you run things in, in production, because in production, you need some capacity to run your, your uh, services, and you want to know when I spin up this container for my service, how much memory and CPU does it use and is it is it going to you know uh, uh, is it uh, if you know how much CPU and memory it uses then you know how you, then you can also uh, specify that and make scheduling and, and and upgrading your systems and and scaling up and down much easier and also one process per, per image is really important and also you can also incorporate load testing in your uh, testing pipeline to see if what's happening when there's a lot of load on your uh, service. Stable. So make sure you lock the image version. So if you are using a Docker file, you can pull from a base image. And a lot of time what I see that people are just pulling it from the latest. And well, you don't know which latest is the latest is. For instance, if I run my system on my local machine pulling the latest image, and then my coworker works on my, my system the next day and pulling that image latest, there can be a change in the latest version. So make sure that you lock the image versions or create base images on-prem for your own, uh, to, which you can trust. And also lock the runtime versions of, of the, of, if you're using Ruby or Java, just lock those versions. And also important, check your image, that you know this image is tested has this version and is going to deploy in production. When, when it's running in production, you can determine where that image is coming from, from which test and which branch in your uh, code repository. And also, uh, with your team, make um, 
um, talk about uh, proper logging, I mean, if you are going to from microservice architecture, you've got a lot of different services. You've got a lot of logs. So if you have like an elk stack, how do you search through all those logs? So make sure that you come up with these guidelines of logging. And set, mean, mean, with set, I mean um, use volumes wisely. So it's really easy that you can say, I run this thing on my local machine and I just mount my host system. But what does that mean for production? Is that host always there? What happens when the host dies? So it's really important that you also think about external services for persistency. So don't be, abuse that host system. So make sure that it's loosely coupled. That's also what microservices are. So make it loosely coupled. So if you need something like uh, persistency, make sure that you do something like cluster FS, that when you have like a network attached uh, storage, which can just, you know, move this, the, um, the storage uh, with your containers. And also remove things which are hard to maintain in production. So if you do like really weird things with volumes where you can easily, you know, uh, develop on your local machine, make sure that it won't go into production because that's, that's hard to maintain. So now what? So we've got the right image. We've got this nice service. We've got this, you know, we want to run this container in production. So what are we going to do? So this is a little bit of a reality check here. So I did some research on our customers, how our customers are using Docker. And this is not uh, saying they're doing it wrong. It's part of the learning process. And if you, go, if you uh, looked at DockerCon or went to DockerCon, you see a lot of you know, great user cases, it's great. But if you look how people are using it, 70% of our customers are still using it for monolith containerization, meaning they just create a fat image where, for instance, Ruby on Rails is running in. This is, I mean, this is okay because it's for multi-tenant. It's quite interesting to, just to run different um, containers on one host. But 70% is still using that way. And I think it's still of a learning process because it's like going from a, from, from, from latest uh, legacy code to maybe a greenfield microservice architecture. That's also what I'm seeing with our customers. So you see that 20% is going for an API first containerization approach where they split the monolith into an API and a front end, but still using fed images. And then you see the first steps in splitting the monolith containerization, 6% of our customers. And then what you see is that the API consists of a tiny image, and then they scale up the API if they need more capacity. And on the other side, there's workers with a tiny uh, image and spin up the workers if they need more capacity. And you see that the front end is still using the fat image in this uh, example. And this is where we're talking about today, about Microsoft architecture. And 4% is really adopting the Microsoft architecture. And most of what we're seeing are greenfield projects start experimenting. So how does this work? How do, can we test this? And how does this run in production? So if we talk about microservices, uh, micro images, I was also talking about micro platform. And I, I was thinking about this. I, I, it's a little bit of a love conversation of energy. Um, so we want to have like microservices, we want to create my little images, but is our platform also micro? Because still we need to do a lot of things. If you look at your microservice on this picture, you see that you need stuff like the life cycle of your software. So how do I, you know, make sure my team um, is, um, is following these guidelines? Uh, deploying the new code, all that stuff. Discovery is really important. Discovery meaning where, how can my, my microservice find the other ones? How do they find my database? When I scale up, when I scale up a lot of containers, will one container find the other ones? So the discovery is really important on your platform and also monitoring, especially with, with microserver architectures where you have a lot of containers running. It's really important that you have a good monitoring system because all those services are going to log some information you want. So it's really important that you also take care of the monitoring. So what you're seeing is that you need a lot of stuff like scaling. Uh, scaling, of course, is, I mean, do you get a signal when your workers are overheated? <laughs> do you want to scale up those workers? Auto scaling, do you want to add new services? What about scheduling? Um, so you have to schedule those services 
You make sure that, that if you run things in production, that your front end is on maybe on all nodes. When one node, one node is down, it still can redirect through a pro, uh, load balancing to the right healthy um, servers. And also security. So you want to make sure that each server is secure, that nobody can break into your, your services, that, that, your, that your Docker host is secure, all that stuff. So you really need to take care of that. And also data management. What are you going to, to do with data? I already talked about when you create the right image, um, you need something like maybe um, a MySQL database or uh, MongoDB. So are you going to run that in a container or you just deploy it as part of your infrastructure? So there's all things you need to take care of. And also orchestration. Orchestration is quite a, I mean, the last couple of months, everybody's talking about scheduling and orchestration. For me, orchestration basically meaning that I, if I need more capacity, I just want to add another server make sure that the whole infrastructure is deployed, that I can deploy my containers and that the containers can find each other and, and scale up. So if you look at this picture, you see that starting with, I mean, microservice, microimage, but your micro, your platform is that, not that micro in that sense. So uh, I created this picture. So it's basically, you have a big elephant with a microservice. And it's really important when, when you are going for Microsoft architecture and uh, using containers, what kind of platform you're going to choose. Are you going to choose like a big platform where you have everything? Are you going to just run it on one single node? So there's a lot of uh, very, uh, different ways to do it. Of course, Classic is one, but you can, of course, choose which is the right thing for you. And if you choose the platform, it's really important that you take note of those things. Lifecycle, is it easy to deploy? Is it easy to incorporate with my developers? Does it do discovery? How what about monitoring, scaling, the scheduling, the security, the data management, and the orchestration? So again, choose your platform wisely. So when you get your dev DevOps right, and I mean with DevOps, I mean with with Docker, you basically give the developer some operations power because the developers already, depending how you set up, of course, your team, the developers already created Docker files. And Docker files is the basic, you're basically creating, well, a container is not a VM, but you're creating the runtime environment for that code. So it's really important when you're doing DevOps and, do it and, and going for containers in production that you Make sure everybody is on the right track and that you really create this, this perfect, you know, with the five kisses, um, slim image. And also the testing. Testing microservice architecture is, it's hard. And I'm still learning, uh, everybody's still learning. If you go to conferences, people are still trying to figure out what is the best way to test it. And you find testing platforms and best practices uh, on the blog, blog post, but still everybody try to figure it out. And it's also important for your for your team to find out what works. If your testing takes a lot of time, then probably your developers will abandon the testing, and that's also bad. So you you need something which makes it makes it easy, fast to test your microservices. And of course, if your microservice architecture get right, and also, I mean, my advice is when you if you are new to microservices and just start with a greenfield project, just maybe a side project with your team, just to see what it can do for you. And of course, creating the right minimal lovable image. And if you're having the right platform to run the containers, you're in happy camper. So, this is the end of my presentation. And um, I think, uh, many, you, you're taking over right now, right? Yes. Um, so I just yeah. want to, to give a short wrap up. First of all, thanks, Daniel, for this presentation. Uh, it was really helpful. Okay. And I hope this webinar gave everybody um, a good feeling for why creating microservices and a microservice architecture and using Docker is a very good idea. We can see, we, we visited DockerCon um, last week and 
also you can you saw from Daniel's presentation that the numbers of uh, how people and software teams uh, develop today and the modern software development process uh, a lot of it will be using the technologies and the processes that you have he uh, heard and learned about in this webinar um, so Daniel explained why a microservice architecture is really powerful and he also showed some best practices on how to build your Docker images. And you also um, saw a bit on how you can use the CodeChip chat platform and the um, CodeChip chat CLI tool um, to help you with continuous integration for your Docker projects. And uh, you also got a look into the Cloud 66 platform and I think everybody saw that it is, it is very strong and a, and a very good product. So. I encourage you to try both CodeChip and Cloud66, obviously. Um, and lastly, I'm happy to tell you that we'll host our next webinar at the end of July. And our very own Laura Frank will give a recap of her talk from DockerCon, um, where she talked about efficient parallel testing with Docker. And that's exactly um, also what she will talk about in the webinar. Um, you can sign up for this webinar by going to the bit.ly link, bit.ly slash CodeChip testing webinar. And I'll also send this through with when, when I'm sending you the video recording and the slides and other helpful material, I'll make sure to send you the link to the upcoming webinar should you be interested in that. Um, but enough again from my side. I think um, there are some questions in the questions panel that um, Daniel yeah. would like to answer. And I'm handing over again to you, Daniel. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I see a couple of questions uh, talking about will the slides be available afterwards. So many was already telling that. So uh, next week we'll make the slides available and also the recording, so you can watch it again. Um, I got a question from Philip. He's asking about Docker Compose run test. Having all servers being started at the moment of running the test, doesn't it make your test suite too slow? So that's a good, that, that's a that's a good question because. When your tests are going slow, your probably your developers will abandon it. So there are two basically two ways. Of course, you can uh, spin up your. Um, you, uh, uh, so what you're doing is the first time you run Docker uh, uh, Docker Compose run test, it will spin up my my SQL Server and my RabbitMQ, and then run the tests. But those two dependencies, so the MySQL server and and MySQ, will be running, um, uh, will still be running if I, if, I, if I don't stop them um, uh, forcefully. But um, so if you have uh, tests will clean up nicely, you can uh, improve the test just to leave the your MySQ and uh, database running. Um, and also, what I what I like about uh, testing from the uh, outside in is that you really can test your service. You can of course mock, you know, the requests to your to your other services and all that stuff. Uh, but then you're losing maybe uh, some intelligence of your tests. But of course, you really need to take take care of it. So if you have like a lot of tests, which takes a long time, it's better to run your test inside the container of your service. But if you, you can of course make a, a, a more hybrid solution where you can say I test inside my container and then I run a couple of tests outside my container if my container is built and it's um, it's reacting uh, to the right uh, responses. Um, so Christopher is asking the question: Is there a getting started with microservice guide? Uh, link you could share. So there's a, a blog post on CodeChip uh, two weeks ago about microservices. Also, you can go to my uh, GitHub uh, Class 6 Examples webinar CodeChip where you can find all the code I used in this presentation. So you can take a look at it. And also, uh, what you see right now, if you search GitHub for a bit, you find that people are building like microservices architecture frameworks where you can you know just say I want this uh, microservice and then create the code and your tests and a docker file so it's quite interesting to see that's a lot of things going on in that, uh, in that area um, yes so I've got a question from uh, Brendan he's asking do you have any good strategies for seeding a service like API for a service like worker from the worker test suite Yes. 
So, um, so what, what I'm doing with, with the worker, so basically the responsible the responsibility of the work is just receiving work from the message queue and then call the API. So what I'm doing is that I'm just, in the tests, I'm just uh, publishing a work in the message queue and then I'll check if, uh, if, if, if my worker is picking up that service and then I mock the API because I didn't want to start the API in that point. And if I, uh, when I test the API, of course, when you when you are testing inside your container, you can of course use something like if you are familiar, for instance, for Ruby, you have this thing called Factory Eagle where you can create like uh, test uh, variables inside your um, database. But what I'm doing is that I'm just you know uh, calling the API, and in the end, I make a small connection to the database and clean the database. I have a little bit of database cleaner. Um, in place, so that's a way to do it. Um, another question Brendan was asking, so to ensure a clean state between tests, you simple destroy the containers. Yeah, so um, that's what basically what I'm doing. So I, I destroy the containers and then I'll run the tests. And the same, what I'm saying is that um, if your tests are, after your tests, cleaning the beta database, you can leave your database and your MSQ running, so that makes your tests faster. Uh, let me see if I have other questions. <laughs> um. So, Rubik is asking the question, what would need to change Docker Compose to only target dev machine? For instance, no cloud, scale one. So, you, uh, so basically the Docker Compose file you find in the Git repository, you, if you do like Docker Compose, up in the, it just runs on your local machine. It doesn't need scale, so it's only run one container for one server. So you can easily run it on your system. So the worker is not exposing any Ports, so you can scale up the worker without penalty, but uh, if you want to test your scaling up your API or your front end on your local machine, you need something like a reverse proxy. proxy in. So there's a couple of interesting uh, containers uh, on the internet where you can easily do some reverse proxying on your local machine just to test uh, scaling up and down. Uh, another question from Daniel Gressman. He asks, would you recommend securing at host level, only allowing access to resources from specific hosts? Yeah, good question. So definitely if you are going for a, a multi-server uh, Docker cluster, make sure that you, you install your firewalls, that you make sure that only the different nodes can communicate to each other. Um, use like an overlay system like Weave to weave all those things together. Uh, at Cloud66, we already provide that. We make sure each node in your Docker cluster is secure by default, so we install um, firewalling and make sure that everything is closed except the communication between your services. And only explicitly we open the ports to the service who wants to uh, communicate to the internet. And another question from from Mr. Rubek. Are most people projects able to build Docker file in Docker Compose with Jomo? I use shell script with two Docker files, uh, one to compile, check out with keys, and then uh, deploy, deploy the product to images. So yeah, so there are people using Docker files and Docker Compose, but if you want to create your image, so what you can also do is using Habitus for that. With Habitus, it's an open source uh, build, uh, Docker build flow tool where you can say, first step is to pull the code, uh, compile the code, take the, take the artifact out, put it in an image, and then use that image for your Docker Compose. So there's different ways to do it. 
So Elvin is asking a really interesting question. His question is, should monolithic apps be broken up first into microservices first, or is it okay to dockerize the monolith app as it is? So what I'm talking in my presentation, there's a learning curve here. So if you have like a monolith, monolithic app, just go, first step is just containerize it. Just to get familiar with Docker and Docker and how production and all that stuff and from that point you, you you gain some experience how how you can use docker on your local machine in your in your testing environments and 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 running that in production and from that point you can look at your monolith and then start you know breaking down the monolith um, so um, there's this um, Sam Newman wrote a book uh, uh, microservice architecture he has a great that that book is great uh, with examples how to broke, break down your monolith app and make it into smaller microservices. So what we're seeing is that a lot of people just starting with a monolith application and then just, you know, tearing it apart in two parts like an API and a front end. And then from there on they're gonna, you know, maybe start with workers or with other stuff they need. So it's basically this this journey where you uh, step by step break down your monolith. But the first thing is just, you know, get that monolith app uh, dockerized to just get familiar with uh, dockerization. Uh, I think I... I have, I have time for two more questions. Uh, this question is um, from Stan Carlson. Do you build a separate container from, from running end-to-end -end tests? Um, so, what you can do is basically you create your services like your API front end and um, and worker. And if you want an end-to-end -end test, uh, I created indeed I create a separate container with my cucumber tests. Then I can say just run those tests. So I say just run the test, then it spin up the cucumber and make sure, and then the API worker and front end are running, and then I can do all the testing I want. Uh, Ryan is asking the question: Is there a service for deploying Docker images to Internet of Things devices? Um, I believe there is there is a company doing that. Um, not sure, but. If you are deploying Docker images to Internet of Things device, probably the Internet of Things device is running ARM processors. And the nice thing, if you run the new uh, Docker for Mac, you can also build uh, ARM-based uh, containers. So you can develop your ARM-based um, services on your local machine and deploy it on your Internet of Things. But um, I don't know if there's any platform right now which can you can say, this is my Internet of Things, just deploy my Docker container. And um, okay, this is um, yeah. We we have time just for go one through. more question. I would say then we yeah can wrap yeah. It up. I'll do one more question, and then there's a lot of questions. <laughs> That's good. Good good discussion. So I will do the last question, and then I'll finish this. Um, so this is a question by Matthew. Uh, as far as I understand. Asynchronous messaging help us in, if a service goes down. But if, but what if the message queue like Rabbit MQ goes down? How do we make sure those queues stay up? So that's a good question. So basically, also your Rabbit MQ has to be clustered, so it has to be highly available. So if you run like uh, uh, a message queue, also make sure that it's clustered uh, over your uh, infrastructure. So it's good. I mean. RabbitMQ is really stable, but if your host goes down, your RabbitMQ goes down. So it's it's also good that your that your workers also can take care of it when the message queue goes down. But uh, you make sure that RabbitMQ is also highly available. I think uh, this is my last question uh, to answer. Thank you all for um, for listening to me and uh, many. So next week you get uh, the recording plus uh, our our. Um, all the slides and uh, well, talk soon. Thank you very much. Yes. Goodbye, everyone. I'll send through the recording and additional material.
and hopefully see you next month at Laura's webinar. Bye-bye.